today's world where you can literally watch any type of hunting video you want, you know, our favorites are the ones that have a good story to go with them. You know, that's kind of what we believe we are. We're storytellers. If we can do that story justice through the lens of a camera, then we've achieved our goal. And that's what we're going to try to do with the story of this deer we call the Big Ten. The story for the Big Ten began last year in 2019. Um, at the beginning of the year, I was targeting a different, different buck. And I was pretty much banking my whole season on that deer and really no other bucks were on my radar. Um, but while I was hunting that deer, I did get a single trail cam photo of this Big Ten. It was October 30th. And the other buck was still at the top of my hit list at that time. So my attention was never really on the Big Ten until my target buck got killed on November 12th. Then I shifted my attention to this Big Ten as the next option. And uh, my very first hunt for this deer wasn't until November 22nd. So I was getting a little bit of a late start on trying to learn this deer and uh, just kind of see where he spent most of his time. That afternoon, Grant and I decided to hang a stand in a location where we could see a lot of the property. And uh, to our surprise, our very first hunt, or our very first day hunting this deer, we see him way off in the distance. Keep an eye on him, tell me if he hears anything. He looks good right there. So it was a good encounter, good to see him on our first hunt. Um, and I thought maybe we were starting to be in the game now. It's my favorite time of year. I love that third week of November. But in the back of my mind, I knew this property and I knew how challenging it was going to be to hunt one specific deer with a bow just because of the lack of options to hunt in and uh, the makeup of the property. Got a 170 inch buck, five coyotes, nothing can hear us. <laughs> the next day we moved up the field a lot closer and this is a pretty common strategy for me when it comes to figuring out deer, figuring out new properties, it's just making adjustments. I'm, I've always been a big fan of being mobile, doing a lot of hanging hunts, um, being able to bounce around a lot and make adjustments based on sightings. So that's exactly what we did. November 23rd, we moved up the field a lot closer to where he came out the night before. In this latter part of November, bucks can be very callable and I love using that strategy. And uh, I just, it worked on him, but I, the wind was a little bit dicey. And I mean, I should have known better. I probably shouldn't have called to him in that situation. But having seen him for the second night in a row, I wanted to take advantage of that and I, and I would have probably regretted not at least trying to call to him um, but unfortunately he came downwind just enough didn't come and probably got within 60 yards or so uh, obviously not in bow range and uh, he definitely picked up a little bit of our wind so that was not an ideal end to that hunt but nonetheless good to see him two nights in a row. I hunted this tree one more time after that, a couple days later, did not see him. It wasn't until December 2nd of 2019 that I went back in there again, went to that same tree. And normally I don't hunt the same tree very often, but this property, as you see, as I go through this, there are very few options as far as trees that be able to hang a tree stand in, especially two people. Um, so I went back to the same stand on December 2nd and ended up having our third encounter with the Big Ten. Once again, I was able to call this deer almost on the same path that I called him in on uh, a week or so prior. Uh, but again, he did not commit. And having these encounters, you start to learn a deer's personality. And while he responded to the calling, he didn't come in aggressively at all. And part of that was, you know, maybe he's checking things out, maybe the wind wasn't right, stuff like that. But I also think it lends to this deer specific personality. In two years of, of hunting him and getting a lot of trail cam pictures with him and establishing that history, I learned that he just was not a super aggressive deer. And I've hunted deer like that in the past. And in my opinion, those are the most challenging deer to hunt, the ones that are not super aggressive, that aren't very visible and covering a lot of ground, stuff like that. They're a little more reclusive, a little more to themselves. And this deer definitely fell under that category. He just was not very aggressive, and most of the time, he liked to hang out on his own. A couple days later was my first hunt with a ghillie suit. It was actually my first hunt ever in a ghillie suit. I had borrowed one from a friend, and 
just got to thinking that this property with a lot of the good ground cover, a lot of the good native grasses would lend itself well to this style of hunting. Um, and plus I wanted to try it, you know, having not had experience in the past, I wanted to give it a real shot just because it, it seemed to make sense as a viable option to kill this deer. It's December 4th, afternoon hunt. We're trying something a little bit different. We're trying a different spot. You know, I've been hunting him up on that cut cornfield that's up the hill from me here. Down below here, there's some standing beans. And obviously I've been hunting up there and I've been seeing him up there, but I haven't hunted down here to know whether or not he's coming down here every once in a while too. I've had some hunts where I haven't seen him up there, so maybe he comes down to these beans. I know there's deer hitting him, I just don't know if he's one of them. I'm out in this CRP in Grants. There's actually a row of trees big enough trees to hunt out of and that's where Grant's at. It just is you're kinda out of the game as far as a bow shot. So I'll see what happens in that. Try to position myself. There's a little bit of a lane that leads down these beans. If he did that it'd be about perfect. This hunt was one of the first real heartbreakers for me because I felt like we had such a good chance of getting him. Uh, he was working his way right towards me. Uh, everything was set up really well. I felt really blended in out there in the, in the grasses. Um, unfortunately, I just got a couple does too close to me on the downwind side and they took the whole herd with them. But everything was playing out to perfection until that moment. And I think having this many encounters already with this deer and uh, him winning every single time. Little did I know it was just the beginning, but it, it was starting to feel a little bit like deja vu of, of okay, this is gonna be a really challenging deer to hunt on this property. Um, just trying to figure that out, it, it seemed like this is the beginning of him beating me a lot of times. The next two evenings, I donned the ghillie suit again, and while I had some good hunts, uh, the Big Ten was a no-show. Moving into the late season of 2019, uh, again, going back to trying to figure out how to effectively hunt this property, I had put out a redneck hay bale blind um, out in the CRP, close to the food sources, thinking that would be a pretty good option um, to at least stay hidden out there. Um, but it's hard to get close to the deer, especially when they're bedding out there. It's hard to be really in the game when you're still at the ground level and not being mobile like you can in a ghillie suit. But nonetheless, I thought it'd be a good option. And December 26th, uh, we found ourselves sitting in that bail blind and uh, it was encounter number five with the Big Ten. I had another empty sit out of that hay bale blind a few nights later, but then January 2nd, I got back in it and uh, he came out by himself and I thought we were in the game that night. Uh, but when he got away that night, it kind of felt like that was it uh, for that season anyways. It felt like we'd been beat so many times and uh, it just, the opportunities seemed to slip away. He always seemed to make the right move uh, just to narrowly avoid us taking him. So uh, that was it for 2019. I knew rolling into this year what the top of my hit list would look like. Uh, that was the deer because of the challenge of hunting him. That was the deer that I most wanted to target. I was also excited about the opportunity to have a, a full year and a full season of targeting a deer rather than starting in late November like I did in 2019, uh, kind of being late in the game and playing catch up. As October neared, there was a couple things that I was going to key on. First of all, there's not a ton of deer on this property, so I was hoping with a limited amount of does and if he was cored up here, uh, I'd have a good chance at him out seeking that first hot doe. And so I was really going to bank on kind of doe congregation areas in order to get on him. 
And secondly, of course, I was going to key in on those October cold fronts to try to catch him up and moving on his feet. We all know how, how effective those early season cold fronts can be. October 12th brought our first really good cold front of the season. And um, while I didn't have a ton of confidence in this deer being in the area, because the trail cameras just weren't showing him very consistently, um, I still wanted to move in and hunt him on those conditions. So October 12th was our first hunt of the year for the Big Ten. A few days later, we were back in that same spot after seeing a lot of those, and that brought the first encounter on another good October cold front. Oh, I got him. I got his body. This encounter was just another example of how much of a roller coaster ride it was chasing this deer. You know, when he was standing at that creek crossing, if he comes across, there's a good chance he comes out in front of us and, and something caught his attention and made him run off and it was almost every time we saw him, it was always something like that, uh, that just almost dumb luck that he didn't come our way. And uh, over and over and over again, he beat us that way and it just, again, it kept us coming back for more. We bounced around a little bit for the next week, week and a half. Um, hunted him a, a few times, and most of the time we were in spots still trying to really learn. He didn't seem to be doing a lot of the same things that he did the previous year, so we were trying to kind of relearn it. And so we were sitting in spots where we could see a long ways, and we had a few empty sits during that stretch of mid-October. The next really good hunt came on October 25th. We are set up on that little micro plot that we planted specific, specifically for that deer, looking towards the area that he bedded in in 2019. And sure enough, once again, he was the first deer we see come out. Well, I thought we had a really good chance of him coming our way that evening. Uh, I wasn't super disappointed uh, when it didn't happen. I was really just hopeful that he had moved back into his main bedding area because he spent so much time there in 2019 that I thought I had a good plan of how to key into that spot. But this is really the first time this year that we saw him there. So my hope after seeing him there was he was going to establish uh, his roots in that spot a little bit more and uh, maybe become a little easier to hunt. A couple days later, October 27th, we had moved back down the hill, down towards where we had that first encounter with him, and uh, we had barely gotten set up in the tree, heard a grunt, looked up, and sure enough, once again, first deer that comes out. This was another encounter that hurt because you, you hate spooking deer, especially on a property like this where uh, there's, you don't have a lot of room for error. And for him to get downwind of us, uh, it kind of messed up that spot in my opinion. Uh, so that was a little bit of a heartbreaker there. And it was just a matter of not being able to shoot in the direction. It was just too thick in the direction. He was in well within bow range, 35 yards. Just couldn't get a shot through all the thick brush. And uh, you just hate spooking a deer, a, a deer that's that old, that smart, that hard to hunt. You know your chances don't come around very often. First day of November, we were back in that same area, but on the other side of the creek, uh, close to where we saw him the first time. 
and uh, we're hanging in this tiny, tiny little tree. Again, it, as you'll see, this deer required a lot of creative sits. Um, this tree was nowhere near big enough for two people. We made it work, and uh, again, we should have had him. He was coming our way, and for whatever reason, a little buck, I think, pushed some does right by our stand. They got our ground stand from where we were setting up, and uh, that was enough to steer him off course and, and have him not continue on his path right to us. Over and over again, it was a common theme that you would find little ways like that to get by us or our hunts would get messed up somehow. It was uh, like a reoccurring bad dream and you, you just felt like your opportunities were slipping away uh, just because you, you, you know you, you can't get away with that type of stuff forever on a mature deer. So as the month of November rolled on, um, we had a lot of empty sits in November and never saw him again for two straight months. Um, and granted, I didn't hunt every day during those months and I bounced around to other properties, but I did not see that deer from November 1st all the way to January 1st. My goal heading into the January 1st afternoon hunt was just to lay eyes on this deer. I was starting to get a, a few more trail cam pictures, but not much. Again, it was still the middle of the night uh, type of activity, usually just one single picture of him. Um, but I knew he was in the area. I knew we had good food. Uh, I knew with the cold weather uh, that hopefully that would keep the deer close. I just wanted to lay my eyes on him. So we climbed up into a home, homemade blind that night, but I brought the ghillie suit with me. I was thinking that if he gets into, especially some of the standing corn or standing sorghum that's really, really tall, if he gets in that, I be, may be able to make a move. And sure enough, he comes out up the hill, heading right towards the corn, uh, right behind a whole bunch of does. We're gonna have to do something different here. Do you want me free-handed? You want me to back up? Yet another heartbreaker. I mean, it just, uh, here I am a few weeks removed from it and still can't believe that actually transpired that way. And, and for me to have to watch him from about 100 yards away, walk right by my cameraman, w walk right by the blind I was just in an hour before that, is just, it's crazy and yet another example of how that deer just had my number. But as disappointing as that encounter in that evening was, uh, I did gain one valuable piece of information from it. We were able to see where they came out, that group of deer, and how they moved from point A to point B and, and kind of what they were doing. And a lot of times in late season, they're a little more patternable that way. They don't change as dramatically. They tend to bed in the same areas and do the same things. And so a couple of nights later, I was able to use that information to come up with a game plan.
January 3rd, and Connor and I are getting aggressive on the Big Ten again. We were in here two nights ago, and we had a good encounter with him, got close. But when he came down, he came out in front of this big brush pile, some big mound of trees and grasses. And with the south wind, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to try to sneak in and set up in here. You can't hang in any of these trees. I've talked about the challenges of hunting this property before. So we both put on ghillie suits and just brushed ourselves in here. <sighs> Hopefully we can get away with it. I don't know. I don't, we don't feel that hidden, but hopefully he'll come out by himself or uh, not with too many deer. There's been a lot of does coming and hanging around this end. So we'll see. We, we did see one deer moving up in the CRP a little bit. Everything's super icy, so we were really noisy getting in. You just crunch through the ice, and it's not that windy. So hopefully we didn't do too much damage. That deer's not far away, so that's a good sign. It's probably 3 o'clock now. Um, we just, it took forever to get in. We had to cross a creek. So we don't have a whole lot of daylight left, but hopefully the deer start moving and we can lay our eyes on them again.
My God! We just did it. We just did it. Oh. Oh. What just happened? Oh. Oh. Dude, I'm in absolute shock. Dude, oh. I mean, I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Got him laying right there. <laughs> that deer. Dude. Oh man. That deer has had my number. That deer. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> oh. I just looked to my left and he's standing there at 80 yards. <laughs> Out of nowhere. How close do you think he was bedded to us when we came in here? Loud as a freight train coming in here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's you can't pick this up. I mean that deer has had my number so many times. Two straight years of unbelievable encounters. And I, I said over and over again, this property is so hard to hunt and I wanted to kill him with a bow. Obviously, obviously didn't want to do it any other way. But we had to, we were pulling out all the stops. You can see Connor and I both in ghillie suits and just, <laughs> we, we came into this brush pile and just tucked ourselves in, then actually probably deep down didn't believe it was actually going to work but that's unbelievable deer unbelievable story <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> that is oh my gosh that's epic like <laughs> I mean a lot of encounters in the last two years and for us to kill him here 25 yards on the ground. <laughs> Dude. I mean, come on. Oh, here's where I shot him. You can see the brush pile we were in. 25 yards. The arrow's laying right there on top of the snow. Instant blood sprayed all over the top of the snow, but. These are the, the fun ones where you don't have to even worry about tracking. I'm just gonna go get my hands on them. It's been a long time coming. I'm not sure there's a better sight than that right there. Man, there he is. Well, here he is, the Big Ten. Big thanks to Connor who uh, grinded it out all season long. This is the deer that he wanted us to kill. Um, so it was pretty cool that he was able to, to be here and film it. And big thanks to the landowner who allows me to help out managing the properties and, and to hunt deer like this. So this deer has had my number. I've said that a, a thousand times, but there's no other way to put it. Uh, the chase for this deer was second to none. It was. I, it challenged me in a lot of different ways from a bow hunting standpoint. It, it forced me, this property and this deer forced me uh, to hunt a lot different than I ever had before. And uh, for that, I'm thankful. I mean, I learned so much chasing this deer. He was always one step ahead of me. He always made the right move. Um, and I'm just so used to getting beat by this deer that it, it, truly we'd come in here just because we know we had to spend time in here to kill him but we always just felt like our odds were so low it, it was always stacked against us and to get it done uh, it was just crazy tonight's hunt was unbelievable uh, that brush ball worked to perfection somehow 
Uh, we got past all those other deer. We had pheasants flying in our lap. I mean, it was, I looked over at Connor when we had deer in front of us. I was like, this is unbelievable. This is, to, to be on the ground that close to the deer was a really cool experience. And to have him come in by himself and not with all those other deer, I don't know if I would have gotten drawn if all those other deer were with him. So everything was finally worked out in our favor. And like I said, I learned so much chasing this deer. Um, just a, a fun journey and that for me that's what it's all about really cool it's hard to hard to put into words how fun this journey has been with this deer it's a little bittersweet obviously as it always is but man it, it just doesn't get any better than this well this hunt and this story for this deer is one of those that despite as well as we try to document everything it's hard to do it justice I've said before, but this is that's why I love doing this. I love bow hunting. I love the challenge of chasing specific deer. It can result in a lot of slow hunts when you're targeting one deer and he's just not there, um, or he's just moving at night. It, it can make for a really long season, and that's kind of what this year was for me. Um, but nonetheless, I knew I wanted him more than any other buck that I had on my list. This property, I mean, there's. You can count on one hand how many humble trees it has. So we were very limited on options and you know, that's the reason why the last two years you've seen me pursuing this deer with a ghillie suit. Um, I wasn't doing it for the show or to try something different necessarily. I, I honestly believe that was the best chance to kill this deer was on the ground. The prairie's great and it's great for bedding and he bedded in it all the time. He was bedded in it last night uh, before, we, before we killed him. Um, but because it's so good and so tall, that's what allowed the ghillie suit to be a viable option. And so that's ultimately, I love that that's how we killed him, uh, just because I've, I've never done that before and that style of hunting is all new to me. I learned a lot chasing this deer that way. So yesterday driving here, I, I kept going over and over my head how I wanted to get into that spot. I essentially had three options and Connor and I kept talking through which one would be best, the advantages and disadvantages of each. And I finally picked the one that honestly, if I would have gone with either the other two, we would have spooked him based on where he bedded last night. He did not bed in the same spot yesterday as he was three days ago. Um, if I would have came in uh, the other two options, um, almost positive, I would have jumped him out of his bed. But we decided to take the long way around and the, the ice that we have right now is unbelievably loud. There's no quiet access. As you could tell, we had deer on us right away um, and getting those does past us safely was huge. I honestly think he smelled those deer and that's what got him up out of his bed and, and heading that direction. And the does got past us and into the trees without spooking. And I knew we were in the ball game at that point. I was surprised that he wasn't with that group because it was, it, I think it was the same group that he was with three nights ago. Uh, that same little buck was with them. Uh, he just was off bedded by himself last night. It was nerve wracking watching him come in, uh, not knowing which direction. If he comes on the back side of the brush pile we're in, I can't shoot. Um, and he was walking that line that he could either go left or right. But again, those does being in front of us made all the difference because that's the route he took. And because we were sitting on the ground right there, I knew I couldn't draw early and wait. I had to wait until I could actually shoot him to draw because I knew he'd spot me drawing and he did. And I knew I had to just be ready to shoot as soon as he stopped. And fortunately, he gave me long enough to settle in and make a good shot at 24 yards. And the rest is history, as they say. It was just, it was hard to believe that it actually happened. Um, again, I didn't actually believe I, this deer was very killable. Incredible deer, incredible hunt for him the last two years. And man, it's, it's one I won't forget for sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed the, the story of the Big Ten. Um, this is probably the most bittersweet I've ever felt after taking a target buck. Um, actually, even probably more bitter than sweet. You know, you think about just two years of hunting this deer, hunting this property, showing up, hoping to see him, you know, getting the trail cam pictures of him. All that's gone now. I mean, you don't get, you don't get to do that again. And uh, it's a weird feeling for sure. I mean, on one hand, you accomplish the goal of of getting this deer and hunting hunting him the way you wanted on him but um, 
because of the reason I love to do this and I love to chase and have so much respect for these animals, uh, it is, there's a sadness for sure when the chase is over and the, and the quest is, is done. It's one that I certainly won't forget. And again, like I said earlier, this is what we love to do. At, at our core, we are storytellers. And while I know it's not possible to do it justice and, and to put you in my shoes of being able to go on the chase the last couple of years, we try our best to document it through the lens of the camera. And then on the production side, you know, Josh's creativity is second to none. And I'm really excited to have this one to, to look back on for many years to come. Moving forward, we got one show left. We have one more good hunt and good story to bring you next week uh, before we transition into all our off-season activities. We appreciate you guys' support the entire season. We'll see you right back here next Monday.